Okay. I should be recording. Yes. Okay. So we are recording and we have sound. Thank you so much for your patience. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nicolas Quetesoso, and I am the instructional support specialist here at College of the Desert for the BFIC, which means I'm the instructional support specialist that can work with faculty or staff on any Canvas related training or questions. Um, I can also work with you on uh, questions that are software related, like Microsoft Word or Adobe uh, PDFs with, um, with Acrobat if you're creating materials or content for your courses, particularly distance education courses, anything that's online. So if you're teaching an online course, you have priority uh, for my time and, and my support that whatever I can provide. Um, if you're doing a web enhanced course, then you're kind of down one step. And if you're not teaching any online courses yet, but you want to uh, get some support or learn Canvas, as long as there's time, um, I'm happy to work with you. The real limitation is my position is 19 and a half hours a week and only 11 months. So there'll be times that I'm just not available, unfortunately. But we're working on uh, doing as much as we can to provide you support. That's one of the reasons why we're documenting these types of trainings and uh, you have the hard copies and the emails and those documents are also gonna be posted on your course, so they'll be available to anyone who would like to use those. Before we get started, now that I've given you a brief introduction of myself, let's go around the room and uh, uh, just a quick, very, very short introduction of each of you. We'll start over here on my left. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> my name is Bob Beck, and uh, this is my first time teaching. Um, and I'm really looking forward to your systems department. I'll be teaching. Microsoft Word and Microsoft PowerPoint and uh, computer essentials in the spring. And uh, maybe next fall, I'll also be teaching web design. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Tiani. I'm an art history and history and humanities professor. Um, I taught here back in 2009 in the art history department. Then I left, took over a PhD program at UCR, and now I'm back. This is my first semester back here, but I've been teaching for 10 years in And I teach, I am teaching online classes. Excellent. As you can see, and Marina Valley started my day. Uh, <laughs> I was just a strong armed into taking about two weeks ago. So uh, my welcome letter will be my actual welcome letter. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. As long as it's not bronze. <laughs> I'm sometimes clueless. This is my tenth year here, and uh, I've been in education almost twenty years now. And every day I wake up, I'm trying to keep up. That's where I'm at. I like online. I'm a lover. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm Matt Felton. Uh, I'm the new distance education instructional design coordinator here at CU. So um, I really appreciate you taking this course. Uh, you are joining uh, 120 other faculty members uh, to see if we can get completed successfully completed this course uh, series of. Uh, courses, I should say. This course has two parts to it, and then there's another self-paced course. So I'm just thrilled that you're a part of it, and I would echo your comments about Nicholas. He yeah. has been uh, uh, he's an exceptional resource here, and I know that he has a, uh, a wonderful training uh, for you today uh, to talk about some of the Canvas essentials that you need. Thank you. I'm Maria McBride. This is my first semester here. Um, I most recently taught at um, uh, Clark Community College for a uh, Canvas course, so you were asking me about this course, and um, it is online, and uh, now I'm teaching in ESL, mm -hmm. uh, the Communications Department, and um, yeah, 
uh, so I'm excited about um, doing this. I used Canvas uh, extensively, but that was on a previous project. So I'm not sure that's great. Right, but um, yeah. Thank yeah, you very much. Um, Um, I am currently um, a new adjunct for the computer information system um, teaching award course, um, which has been very fun. And this uh, class, I'm so happy to be a part of it because I've already found a lot of value um, to uh, take from this course. And I'm looking forward to learning more than we took today. So, workshop. I also am the career center specialist in our career and workforce solutions center. Um, so, I'll see you next week when we get into it. I'm Steve Gibbs. Um, I teach an international student education. Um, into the government, business law, and real estate development. And I use uh, Canvas currently on all three of those courses, uh, all the courses on Canvas. And I want to uh, extend my red cross so that I can exceed the 10 credits and not be a criminal. <laughs> We're only allowed two 10 credits at the moment. Uh, and maybe go for another fiscal term, uh, fiscal education. Right. And also, I'm going to be. 64, so I'm thinking I'm not going to be able to go to school all the time for the rest of my life. Who knows? <laughs> I better be able to sit home and do my job just in case. <laughs> Good strategy. Uh, my name is Carl Christian. I teach Kings Christian Studies, and I've taught hybrid uh, at other schools in the past, and they won't let you teach hybrid here, so I'm finally uh, get certified for that. And I've been using uh, technology for years, although since I've been adjunct for a long time. I just got my own website because I was getting tired of doing the blackboard at a half dozen different campuses. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I transition and doing hybrid here, I'm just going to keep my own uh, email on here. Sounds good. Well, I'm glad to hear that so many of you are already using Canvas. Um, this is pretty much the Canvas essential. So we're going to go over setting up a course, and it's a little bit of an introduction. I'm going to go over the material fairly quickly just because of time. But if you do have questions, we'll try to answer them um, as succinctly as possible. And we are recording this session, so other, other I guess, uh, in attendees will see it, or whoever else is enrolled in the course will be able to review this, and then they can complete their assignment. Um, one of the reasons that I gave you such detailed handouts is so that I can go quickly. So I won't be reading everything on those handouts. Those are pretty much the outline. I'm going to be demonstrating uh, and recording that. If you would like to follow along and go into your own canvas and just play with your sandbox while we're working, if a question comes up, you know, I'm happy to answer that question. But otherwise, we're just going to get started. So I know that most of you already created your profile. So we're going to just do a very quick review of the profile. And you probably already know, if you've gone into Canvas, that it's broken up into a few different sections. So usually on the far left of your screen, you're going to have the global navigation menu. And that starts with account and it ends with help. That's where you're always going to be able to access your um, your courses, your inbox, the calendar, and your account settings. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to go into account settings and we're going to look at how to create a profile. So you click on accounts and then profile. And if you're just getting started like I am, there's really not a lot of information here. There are a couple of ways that you can add information. The contact is populated from the settings link. And this is going to be the page that will allow you to um, add services like Twitter or your Google Drive. And that's a way that other users and students can contact you. Right now, my registered services don't have anything, but there are suggestions. So if I wanted to add a LinkedIn account or a Twitter account, I could click on either of those options and add that information. You can also see what integrations, what other types of app or apps or the learning um, integrations you would have already assigned to your course. 
So because I play with a lot of different things when I'm working with faculty members, I have McGraw-Hill here, I have the roll call, I have comments, I have Pearson. It looks like I'm very busy, which I am. <laughs> um, so if you sign up for something like a publisher's online resource, it would be showing up under approved integrations. Can I yes. Um, I have one. I already loaded in something. Okay. But it's not showing up in the integration. Which one is it? Um, Norton, something Norton. Whatever Norton. comes with Norton. Norton. I don't know about that one. Some of the integrations, if they don't actually need to be connected to the grade book, for example, they're not going to be here because they're not. Yeah, so we'll have to look at that one. If you want uh, to email me that application, we can look at it. Have you already started using it with the yeah. class? Yeah. Hmm. Usually it's supposed to be there. But those will be added automatically when you sign up for it in your course. So we'll, we'll talk about that once we go into course settings. If you want to add a profile biography, go back to profile and the edit menu is kind of hidden. It's these three little dots on the upper left. So once you click that, then you see edit profile and you have the option of typing in your biography information. We always suggest that you create content in a word processing program like Word so that you have a spell check option. We don't have that tool in Canvas right now, so it's not going to catch if you misspell schedule or something like that, but uh, you can copy and paste from Word. And then if you want to add links uh, to any type of other resources or, or anything about yourself, if you have your own web page, your department page, you just title the link and add the URL. If you have more than two that you'd like to add, you click on the add another link button and you'll get another space. This particular set of options require saving. So in Canvas, some options are saved automatically as you adjust them. Others, like your profile, you need to click on that Save Profile button or it will not remember your changes. Also under your account, you have your notification settings. And these are very important, otherwise you could get inundated with notifications. So if you click from account to notifications, you get your preferences. And there are four preferences that you can choose. Notify me right away, send a daily summary, send weekly summary, or do not send me anything. So in the handout, I've given you an example of what each one of those settings looks like. You have a checkbox, you have the clock, you have the calendar, and you have the X. And those are in order of those four settings. You can control the notifications for course activities, for your discussions, conversations, groups, alerts, and conferences. If you leave everything set to send me immediately, for example, anytime a student uh, submits an assignment, you will get notified. So if you have 100 students on not online, when they're doing their homework and submitting, you're just going to get notification after notification coming through uh, your inbox. And that's why not being notified or getting a summary might be preferable. And these are an example of settings that you do not to save. You do not need to save. As soon as you make a change, that's, uh, that change is updated in Canvas. So there's no save the notifications button. Now we're going to go into some really important settings, and this is going to be for your course. Wait, can I, so, can we go back to that? Yes. So these are all telling you, the instructor, things that happened in Canvas in your classes. Things that happen in Canvas. Either with students writing you individually, or student requests, or. So we'll look at a couple of the notifications. So for example, if you're scheduling and you set up a group of appointments, every time a student makes an appointment with you from that group, you can have it 
notify you or you can get a summary or you don't have to get a notification. If you have, let's see, for grading, um, for announcements even, uh, if you, or all submissions. So under course activities, all submissions is a good example. So if you create an assignment and you have a submission, anytime a student makes a submission, so anytime they, they add something to that assignment, you could get a notification. So you can decide, do you wanna be notified for each student individually by summary? Do you want a week's uh, summary of all of your submissions or do you not want submissions? We can't change it by course. So this is for you globally. And the other question that has come up is, do you get to control notifications for students? And the answer to that question is no. Each user in Canvas gets to control how their notifications are set up. So why would anyone want to be notified every time a student submitted? That's a very good question. <laughs> and um, I don't know anyone who so far has chosen that, but some people do. That's kind of my question. Like, I mean, what, most of these, obviously scheduling makes sense if you're setting something up. I haven't done, I haven't used that capability or whatever. But I mean, most of them, it seems to me like you wouldn't want to be notified all the time. Any time an announcement goes out. Yeah. Uh, I don't hardly use any of them, but when announcements are put out within the department that all students get, I like to have that track to me so I'm aware if you're in history or whatever it is you were teaching art, maybe there's something I'm aware of in the department because it came out to all students, but it's not my announcement generated, but it comes out through Canvas. Does that make sense? I don't think I've gotten anything through Canvas in any challenge. Like, is that happening? Uh, if, for example, you were in a course like the uh, faculty collaboration sandbox, so you're enrolled as a teacher or a student in that course, then you might get announcements from that course. So this is for courses in Canvas. It wouldn't be something sent through COD email. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. So Nicholas, let me make, because that was one of my questions. When I set up the profile, if I have three online accounts, then it's the same for all of them. Is that right? What do you mean by online accounts? Well, I have my sandbox. I have my hybrid. For each one of your courses, yes. Class. It's the same profile. Yes. That was my confusion. Okay, thank yes. you. No problem. Quick question. Yes. Um, sorry to go backwards again. Under profile, you do edit profile. You can't change your name uh, or what you teach. Let's say I just said Stephen Pugh, adjunct professor business law and real estate development. I wanted to add so that is an HR question. That information comes uh, through the student true. information okay. system. Uh, just like we've had a situation where somebody's title is adjunct instead of associate, that needs to be changed with human resources. Okay, thank you. Okay. So we're going to go into course settings now. It says what you're saying under settings. I put my, no, under. If you have more questions about that, you can feel free to email me or call me and we can work on that separately. So we're going to go into your course settings. So I've created a course that we're going to play with called Canvas Essentials. I get to it by going to my dashboard and right now I have the dashboard set up so that all of my courses for this term are going to be options. So when I go into Canvas Essentials for the first time, and this would be something that if you're teaching a course here at COD, the course shell would be set up for you. You don't need to create a course for each of the classes that you're teaching. As soon as you're assigned that, when the system updates, you would have that information. When we enter the course shell, now we have the menu for the course, and it's gonna be adjacent just to the right of the global navigation menu. Starts with home, and then at the bottom, we've got settings. So if we wanna see what you're seeing, we should open up our sandbox first. Like yeah. And when we talk about a sandbox, we're talking about a course that a user creates manually and you have control of that. And it's not, it's never associated with 
student information that is going to get passed back to our student information system. So we can just make as many of those courses and play with them and do as much testing as we like. So, uh, how do you get that course So you go, go to the bottom, the yep, and then you click on settings. Oh, right. Oh, right. Fine. Yeah, you have Thank to scroll you. down. No problem. So we're gonna go over a few settings and there's uh, more detail in the handouts, but um, you have the option of creating when your course would start and when your course would end. So if for some reason you need to change the dates, normally when we set it up, there's not gonna be any dates there. It'll just be our default term dates. And that's set up with the academic calendar. But if you have a late start class, for example, and you want to set the date, you would enter that in the date, in the start uh, field. It's really, uh, it's a good practice to also enter an end date if you're gonna try to change the dates. There have been some changes recently to how Canvas looks at those dates. And when there isn't a date in ends, sometimes we run into some peculiarities with how Canvas works with assignments and the calendar. So if we were gonna add a date here, we would wanna add an end date. And so I'm just gonna put- It doesn't have to be like the official last day of class, right? You it, just make up a date. Yeah. And, and when you know it's not gonna be Right, and if you are going to do something, it's really advisable to put in what the official last date of class is. But for an example, I'm just adding the end of the year. And uh, it wants a time, which I haven't added right now. So if you do need to change those dates, then there's a checkbox. Users can only participate between these dates, in the course between the dates. So Canvas defines participate as being able to submit assignments. Viewing the content of the course is not considered participation for these settings. If you want to restrict students from being able to see the course either before the dates of the term or after the dates, those are further down in the settings. And by default, here at COD, we have those settings, um, we have those restrictions enabled. So if you have a student registered for your fall course, they're not gonna be able to actually view the course until the start date of the course, which is the date that COD sets. If you wanna change that, then you would enter those other dates and it would override those settings. But a lot of times we get questions, what's the difference between participating in the course and viewing the content? So participating limits being able to submit any type of assignments or answer discussions, viewing is actually seeing the course content. So where would you change that? Which if you wanted to change participation, it's towards the top, it's after the dates, and there's a checkbox called users can only participate in the course between these dates. So if you click that, you get other boxes. So if you want them to like get in before you just uncheck those other boxes down below that were switched to them. Yes, that would be if you wanted students to be able to see your course before COD allows the course to be viewed by students, you would need to uncheck those boxes. And then only students who are in the class can see it, right? They yes. Can't make it available. No. So students have to be enrolled, the user has to be enrolled in the specific course. Uh, while we're here, I'm just going to also show you some additional options. Um, at the very bottom of your course details, you have a link called More Options. And this is where you can decide if you want students to be able to create discussions, if you want students to be able to edit their own discussion posts, if you want students to be able to organize their groups. So there are several options here. 
and those are options that you can use to customize the course. There's also a default setting that the most current three announcements will be shown on your homepage. So as you're using announcements, the first or the, the most recent three will show up on your course homepage. If you want more or less to show, this is where you would change that setting. And we'll talk about announcements in more detail uh, later on in this training. So fewer options will hide that whole list. More options will show that list. Course details and, and course settings is also one of those areas in Canvas that you have to save the settings. So as you're making those changes, nothing is gonna take effect until you click on update course details. Course settings is also organized by tabs or by sections. So at the top, we start with course details. And that's, those are the settings for dates that we've been talking about. Now, we're not gonna talk about sections at this time, but we are going to talk about navigation. I have a question about the student group. Yes. So if, if you want, if you, I don't. We're going to talk in great detail about student groups later on in the, the course. The teacher sets up. Yes. But if the students want to set one up, can they set those up and then the teacher has, doesn't see it? Uh, the, the teacher, the instructor would always be able to see the groups that the students create. And the, yeah. content and the content they generate, yes. And is it possible for us to combine sections? For example, I teach uh, many Yes, that's called cross-listing, right. and we can talk about that in more detail. Right now, I believe it's something that we would have Matt do as a DE coordinator, but currently, COD instructors do have the access to cross-list or combine sections. So if we go into course settings again, at the top, we have the tabs, and we're gonna to switch to navigation. When we talk about navigation menu items in Canvas, it's the list of items that appear when you're in the course, just to the right of the global navigation. So it's the list of menu items that starts with home and goes all the way down to settings. You have the option of customizing that list. So for example, if you don't want students to be able to see the files link because you're going to be organizing content with modules or by pages or some other organizational structure, then you can click on the settings for files. And in Canvas, settings is always a little cog. It looks like a little wheel until they change the icon on this again. But right now, it looks like a little cog. If you click on that for files, right now, files is highlighted. If I say disable, it's going to jump from this list at the top to the list at the bottom that says drag items here to hide from students. So when we disable a course navigation menu, we're just hiding it from the students. You as an instructor will always have access to those course navigation items. And this gives you the option of customizing your navigation for your students. So the students aren't going to see links that they don't need to see, or if you want to control how the students interact with the content and the experience they get, you can limit their interactions. One example might be you have links to um, some type of educational resource that you want to organize through content pages in a module. So you really don't want students to see the information from unit two until after they've completed unit one. If you put that information in files, the students will be able to get to that information and it would be out of the order that you're recommending for your course content. But by disabling files, those, uh, that information won't be available to the students. There are uh, five student service related links that College of the Desert encourages instructors, and I'm not sure if we're using required yet, to leave available for the students. And that would be student services, online tutoring, attendance, library, and the smart thinking tutoring. Why are there two of those now? Huh. 
Okay, we need to change that. Yeah, online tutoring should not be there anymore. So smart thinking is our online tutoring right now. And um, if you do, you that? You sh uh, for now, no. And it might just be that I created a shell. So I'll have to look to see if they're showing up on everyone. But it, it might be the, the it is the both. Of, yeah, that happened this semester and we haven't caught that yet. So we'll, we'll address that. So should we disable it in our classes? Or? You can disable online tutoring because we're using smart thinking right now. If you do, for whatever reason, remove those student service links, they're always available to every user in Canvas by clicking on help. So we have added those links to the Canvas help mem uh, menu. Office 365 is the other option that we have for students. So this is where you would drag or disable or enable the different course navigation items. And these, you need to save the changes. So if you move things around and then you leave the page without saving, your course menu is not going to change. So I wanna to talk to you about um, how you can get a feel for what your students are experiencing with your course. As you make changes to the course, as you add content that is published so that's available for the students, you have the option of coming into course settings and on the far right, clicking student view. That's going to give you a look and feel experience of your course as the students see it. So right now, I've switched to student view. It tells me at the bottom of the screen, you are currently logged into student view. It has the option to reset or leave student view. So for example, if you go through and do one of your own practice quizzes, or, or you do a real quiz for practice, the student view is going to show up in your course as a student, and it'll say test, and it'll have that grade. Say you make a change to your uh, quiz and you want to try it again, you don't want an existing score there, that's why we use the reset student button. And these buttons are always at the bottom floating. Now one caveat is that screen, that, that bar that's floating at the bottom of the screen, sometimes it hides settings. So if you start having difficulty getting to something at the bottom of your screen because it's hiding, you can try using your tab key and that a lot of times will find a link that is hidden underneath there. So you just tab to it and then enter and it should open a link that's under there. It happens very rarely, but it can be very frustrating when you're trying to get to something that's hidden underneath the banner. So, um, so if the student took a test that you, or whatever, a quiz or something that you didn't want them to use no one to reset no. Um, this is for your student view only. This is your test students. So this is not related to what your actual students are doing in the course. So you're like inventing like a dumb student. Yes. Okay. And if you are using any integrations, it doesn't work with this. So say you're using McGraw Hill, uh, a publisher's integration we have to give you a different type of test student so that you can play with that particular set of features. So right now I'm gonna leave student view and I'm gonna go back and I'm going to have access to my course as an instructor again. We're gonna go back to course settings because there are a couple more things I want to show you. And course settings, is where you would import course content. So I have to give you this, the disclaimer because the best practice that is recommended by our instructional design coordinator, I'm pretty sure including Matt um, and Canvas, is don't import your content. Build your course each semester from scratch. That is so true. And why is that true, Anna? Because you end up having like triple of everything and then you can't get rid of it. It's like the biggest pain in the boobah. That's one reason. Originally taught. Yes, like, you bring it over. We used to do that with Blackboard all the time. You end up not being able to control the content as cleanly as you want. But as, if you're building it, you have the opportunity to review, refresh, and renew your course content. So it's going to give you that reminder oh, yeah, students really didn't 
have the engagement for that activity that I wanted, I want to change that. I'm going to look for updated content or I'm going to rewrite these assignments. So while we have the option to import course content, we really recommend that you spend the time to build it from scratch. I'm going to go very quickly through the process to import course content. So let's so say. Suggest, so if you have a, you're using a book and there's like online quizzes or other things that other people have mentioned, you think that you should not use any of those or you should import them somewhere else? Like import them selectively, yes. Right. Okay. So if you wanted to use a publisher's quiz, for example, import the quiz that you know that you want to use instead of importing all 500 quizzes that they give to you and put them all in your course at once. Yeah, well, that's what I did with the book rack. I mean, we went through together. We spent many hours focusing. Picking what you wanted. Yeah, yeah. excellent. Yeah. So if you do need to import course content, say I know that I have uh, some assignments or maybe I have some quizzes that I've created in another course from the fall or from the spring, and I want to use them this fall, you start in the course where you want the content to live. So we're bringing content into the current course. So right now I'm in Canvas Essentials. I'm in the course that I want this new content to live. I click on import course content. And again, that link is found under course settings. It's always going to be to the far right of your screen unless you're using one of those little tiny screens and everything on the far right goes to the very bottom and you can't find anything. So you start with import content type. In addition to being able to copy course content from a Canvas course that you have access to, this is where you would, for example, import a Blackboard course or any other type of content that is supported by Canvas. And sometimes publishers will make available something in another format. And this is a tool that we would use to bring that content into your course. If you were bringing something in from a publisher, what we recommend is that you use a sandbox. So you create your test course, bring it in there, go through it, and then decide selectively what content you want in your actual course. So for now, I'm gonna say, I want to bring in Canvas course content. I'm gonna select copy a Canvas course. It's gonna ask me to search for the course. So if you, let's see, why are you not letting me, uh, let me try ARC. So I know that, well, I, I have, no, I did not go through this in detail because we kind of added it last minute. <laughs> so when you see gaps, it's because we didn't have our outline completed and I apologize. So let, let's say, uh, for example, um, I have a lot more courses because I'm an administrator. So I was like, oh yeah, how do I find one that I really want to use? Um, but let's just say I, I wanted to borrow something from this course and you would only see the courses you have access to. It has the option to import all content, which we don't want to do. We want to import selectively. So we select, select specific content. And Canvas is gonna ask us to select specific content, I think three times. So the first time you say select specific content, you're not done. Uh, we're not gonna talk about adjusting events and due dates right now. And one of the reasons why we're not going to talk about that is because we really recommend that you not try to copy an entire course. If you were going to do that, adjusting events and due dates gives you the option for Canvas to try to move all of your spring dates to your fall dates. So it can attempt to shift, say you were teaching a Monday, Wednesday course on, in the spring, and now you're teaching Tuesday, Thursday it will try to move all of your dates to match the semester, but it has to do its best guess for certain dates, especially since, well, now our semester started on Friday and in the spring it started on Monday. So it might have some extra dates and it doesn't know what to do. You're required to manually go through and look at all those dates. Well, if we know you're gonna to have to go through and look at all those dates, that's why we recommend you just go in and create the content for the course. And 
We have this all the time. Somebody says, why is my uh, assignment closed? My, my midterm exam is closed to students. Well, because the dates for availability are still set to the spring semester. And you know that was just an oversight. So once we say select specific content, we click on upload and it's waiting. It wants us to select content again. So we have a bright red button, select content. And it shows us a history of all of the jobs we've run. We click on select content. And this is where we have a tree view. We can copy course settings, the syllabus. We can copy the assignments, the announcements, files. If I had pages in here, pages would show up. It breaks down by Canvas, uh, by Canvas content and, and lets you decide what you would like. So under assignments, I can either click the checkbox and that will select everything in assignments. Or if I want to be more selective, I'm going to uncheck that checkbox. But this arrow to the left of the checkbox, that expands your content tree. And I want to expand assignments again. So these are the assignments. So let's say I just want the midterm test. I would select that checkbox. And Canvas then changes the checkbox for the main assignments, the one at the top that says 11. Now it's a semi-filled checkbox. So it's telling you you're getting some of that content, but not all of it. So once I go through and decide this is the content that I want, this is the third time. Remember I said you have to say select content three times? Now we say select content and it would copy that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do that. Select content, it starts running the job. This is very little content, so it shouldn't take very long. It's completed. If I go to my assignments, and we're jumping ahead to, the next, uh, to our next training, but I'm just gonna show you assignments. It puts it under imported assignments. So Canvas is telling us this is something that you just copied from another course. And we can go through that if you're going to use import content or you have something like Blackboard and you want to do that, I'm happy to work with you. This is also an opportunity to remind you that we have Canvas 24 seven support. So if you call the Canvas phone number anytime, we see people calling at midnight all the time, so don't worry, they're awake they have access to your Canvas account. So they can see everything that we can see. And if you're trying to do what I just walked you through, they would be able to walk you through that as well. Okay. So are you saying, when, so if we're teaching the same class spring and fall, are, is it on us to transfer all that content? Yes. Or is it, so the school doesn't do it? That is an excellent question, yes. When, Fall comes around, you taught your spring course, now you're assigned to fall courses. It could be the exact same course. What, what you will get is a blank shell, an empty container for the fall course. That's already named or that's still called Sandbox? It's named. Okay. So it would be named this semester, it would, instead of spring 2017, it would say fall 2017. So you would be assigned, that's gonna match whatever assignment you have from your department but it's gonna be empty. It's gonna look like this sandbox that I've created or the sandbox that you've created for your course. So then we have to go in and move all the stuff in. Yes. So you... you pay for that? <laughs> That's a Matt question. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the official response is yes, it's part of your... <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I'm just gonna delete this exam because I don't want it here. At RCC, they do it too. But trust me, they, they do a lot of other things. Okay. Although they reduce it $20. There you go. So now that we've set up our course settings and we brought in some content and we're kind of ready, uh, we need to go over publishing the course. So the way Canvas is set up, the students cannot see your course until you decide to let them see your course. That's called publishing. And publishing applies to content and it applies to the course itself. So you could go through and have all your content ready to go and it's all published. And you'd go to student view and you're like, why can't I see anything? Why can't I do anything? Your course isn't published yet. So 
you go to, you enter your course, you click on home, the far right, the menu is now course status. If you have uh, the, so mine is actually published right now. Uh, so I'm gonna click on, no, it is unpublished, good, yes. So when it's unpublished, you don't have the green button, you have the red button. So when you're ready to let the world or the students at least see your course, you click on publish and it's gonna ask you what you want as your homepage. Right now, I'm gonna leave, uh, let's see, I, I can't use modules because I haven't done anything. I haven't created a module. So I'm just gonna select course activity stream choose and publish. And I will now have the green published. So green means published, available to students. In Canvas, red or unpublished means the content is not available to students or the course is not available to students. You have the option. So let's say you're working on your course and you publish it and you realize I'm not ready. I, I just wanted to kind of see what it was gonna look like. As long as students have not gotten in there and submitted any assignments, you can unpublish your course. But if a student gets in there and submits an assignment, you're not gonna be able to unpublish it. So right now, because I don't have any students submitting assignments, I can unpublish this course. And at the bottom of page seven in your materials, we have a very important note per AP 4105, distance education, it states, online courses must be available on or before 8 a.m. on the first day of class. So we will get questions from students. Why can't I get into my, my instructor says I'm supposed to be able to do something. The course is not published and we're in the first or second or third day of class. So we will remind you that uh, we've reviewed that distance education policy with you. So try to get it published before the first day of class, but otherwise it is required. Any questions about publishing? And we're going to talk about what a home page is in a little bit more detail shortly. So how are we all doing? That's on us. We have to make that happen. Yes. So we will not go in and publish your course. Matt, if you really make him angry, he might go in and publish your course. But then I cannot be responsible for what content could be there. I mean. <laughs> I'm just, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just, this is just very different from the way RCC, like RCC, it's like everything just goes live on the day the class starts. Right. So for, it's just different. So. so I think, and Matt might have a, a comment, but I think part of it is instructors at College of the Desert are completely in control over their online content. So what is in the course and when it is available and how it is available to the students. So we're now going to switch to content and storage. We've, we've made a few initial settings uh, set up for the course, but we need to get more information in it. So you have an option as you're building your course to upload files. So let's say we're working with a course that you're transitioning, it's a face-to-face -face class, and now you're gonna be doing your hybrid or your online version. You may already have documents, educational resources that you want to include. You may have videos that are ready to be included in an online setting. So you can use Canvas as cloud storage, and that way you can work on building your course anywhere. You don't have to be on your work computer. You don't have to have it on your flash drive. If you put it in files, it will be available there, and then you can add that content in an organizational structure that is appropriate for your course. Is this number nine? This is number seven, files. Oh, we're still on files. Yes. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna try to speed up here. <laughs> Oh, okay. yeah. So files, uh, and, and this is something that is really common in Canvas, um, and I don't know why they decided to do this. We're used to a grayed out link, meaning that you can't access it. In Canvas, a grayed out link usually just means you can access it, but there's nothing in it yet. So we can click on files, but we won't have any content. So as an instructor, you have files in two places, and even students have files in two places. You have files for your account, 
and then you have files for your course. And every time you add files in a course, they also show up in your account, but you can see all of your files for all of your courses. So if, you, if you're teaching four courses and you go into account and click on files, so I'll go over here to account, there's files. I'm gonna see files for all of my courses. And that could be a little overwhelming if you're trying to just focus on the one course. So rather than kind of coming in here and saying, I wanna to go to Canvas Essentials, I'm gonna go back to my dashboard and choose the course that I'm working in. And I'm just gonna to go to files from within the course. So this way I'm gonna be only working with the files for this course. You can upload files and media, um, images or videos, whatever type of content you're gonna be using, you can upload those things one at a time or multiple files at a time. But if you have a lot of content, then it's advisable to create a compressed folder. So you can spend the time organizing your content on the computer. And you could create a folder, for example, for your content associated with assignments. And I say associated with assignments because you may not want to just uh, write up your, so you probably have your assignment written up as a Word document. But Canvas is gonna give you the option of creating an assignment and putting that text in the body of that assignment, of the, the online version of it. So rather than just saying, okay, I'm gonna take uh, this set of Word documents for my whole semester and post them and have the students have to go in and click on that file and open the Word document and hope that they have Word and, and how are they gonna see it, you're probably gonna to want to rewrite those as actual assignments in Canvas. But you may have documents or videos or something associated with the content, educational resources, that you're calling assignments. That you would put, for example, in a folder called, called assignments. You may have information for uh, discussions that you want to include. So if you're teaching art, you may have some pictures of, uh, what do art, of paintings and sculptures and things, you know? Um, I don't do art, so <laughs> I have to think about that, yeah. Um, so you could put all of those files in a folder called quizzes, and you know that you're gonna be using that material to build your quizzes. So it gives you the option of organizing the documents. And in case anyone has forgotten how to create a zipped folder, uh, let's see if I can find some content. This is not my normal computer, so let's see. Do we have some examples? Uh, maybe. No, we have no, we have no examples. Well, let's go into my USB drive then. So I just want to show you really quickly where I don't have a USB drive here either. Okay. Uh, where can I find some files? So this is still page eight. This is still page eight, yes. So once you have your, your documents organized, so let's say I'm, I'm using these two documents. If you're in Windows, it's very, very straightforward to create a zipped file. And the nice thing about a zipped file is Canvas will see that when you upload it and it'll ask you, do you want to expand all this content? And it'll just take the same organization. So if you've created five folders with a lot of documents each in that folder, you have it nice and organized on your computer, you can pass that organization into Canvas. In Word, in Windows, you select whatever you want to turn into a zipped file or compressed folder. You right click on it, if I can right click on it. And you're going to get send to. And that menu will open and you're gonna select compressed zipped folder. So most, all of your computers, uh, all of your COD computers if you're working on Windows, you have this built in. If you're using a Mac, I don't remember how to do it, but I'm sure it's very, very similar. Same exact thing. Same exact thing. There you go. So it's right click on it, 
get that application menu open and then go to send to. So people forget that it's, it's under send to now. So just say compress zip folder. And then when you're done with that process in Canvas, go to files, click on upload. You get a dialog so, box. So mm -hmm. While you're still in Word, you send it to like yourself on your computer. And then in Canvas, you take it from there. Or when you, after you hit send to and compress folder, what happens after that? So when you select your contents, you go to send to uh -huh. compressed folder. Uh, these are files that it won't let me do because I don't have anything here. Uh, let's see if I can find anything. Okay, yay, I have something. Let's try these guys. So I'm going to go to send to compressed folder. What it will do is it creates a new folder and the icon changes. So it gives you the option to change the name. So this is compressed. So, put in type today. So now you have, it looks like a folder with a zipper on it. That's the icon for compressed or zipped file. When we go into Canvas, we're gonna go to upload and I need to find, where did I have those? I think it's under documents. Where was I? Uh, Custom production canvas studios. Okay. So I've clicked on upload and now I'm searching for, normally I would have put this on the desktop. So now canvas can see not only my video files or my word files or whatever type of document they are, but it can see this compressed folder. And I would just click on open it asks me what would I like to do with this file? I can upload it and there could be a good reason that you wanna leave a file compressed. Maybe that's how you're going to give it to your students. But if you're bringing it and you wanna expand it, you just click on expand and it's going to process that. And instead of a zipped file, I have my regular document. And this is a good time to review, well, what if I put something in here and I wanna get rid of it? There's no settings visible until you point to the actual file or folder that you want to edit. And then at the far right, it highlights the row. The far right, now your settings are visible. So you click on that and this is where you have options, download, rename, move, or delete. So I accidentally put something in Canvas that I do not want there, I will delete it. and now it's gone. Let's see. So another uh, important thing to remember about files, as you upload those, if you allow files to be seen by students, so you haven't disabled that menu, the students, the default setting is for students to be able to view anything in files, but you can change the setting per item and restrict it. So you can choose in files, I don't want students to be able to view this. And you would just kind of go through that process. It's very similar to what I just showed you. You highlight it, right click and say restrict. Let's see. Now I'm gonna show you one, except I don't have any files in here. So one trick. Uh, does anyone see a way to select everything in the folder? Is there a, a checkbox? No because it's hiding. So what I usually tell people, say you have you know, 10, you have a folder and, and you, or you wanna delete everything in it or you wanna select everything in it. There is a way to do that in Canvas. If you click in your, uh, I usually recommend go to your search box and then tab forward and then just before you get to name, the checkbox appears. So this is something that happens in Internet Explorer that is for some reason not visible, but it's there. So that little checkbox will, when there's something in the folder, it'll allow you to select the entire contents of whatever folder you're in. 
So if you want to do a mass rename, a mass update, a mass delete, that's a way to do it instead of having to go through and check each item. Okay. I'm, I'll ask, are there any questions? <laughs> but I know we don't have a lot of time. Okay, great. Yay, we're going to move to the next topic. <laughs> pages, yes. So uh, I'm going to leave files, and I don't have to go home. That's one of the nice features of Canvas. Once you're done in an area, if it doesn't require saving, you can just jump to the next menu item in Canvas. So I don't have to go home. I can just jump directly to pages. And it's grayed out right now because I don't have any content in it. So pages are available from the navigation item, or the navigation menu, and they're a, a way to store contents and educational resources. You can include text, video, links. You're essentially building web pages for your course. Very, very straightforward. Click on add page to start adding a page. So this is gonna be first page ask you to put a title in and this is where in the center uh, the edit box is where you can add your text you can add videos this is a great way to create a welcome page for your students some instructors will use this for each week they might have a different welcome page and that way you're giving students a fresh experience every time uh, one of our hybrid instructors records a new message every week, kind of updating the class and making sure that they're, they're feeling like they're getting that interaction. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the rich content editor in a moment. I just wanna tell you about the other option you have for pages. Pages at the bottom, you can decide, do you want students and teachers or anyone in the course or just teachers to be able to edit these pages. So pages, for example, if you wanted to create a wiki resource, you would possibly want students to be able to edit it. And that's gonna let the students in your course go in and add content and upload videos and they would have the same access as you do. Canvas also keeps track it keeps an entire history of changes to a page. And that might be a tool that you would use to track the participation of students if that was something that you had assigned. One of the home page options is a page, a Canvas page. So if you wanted your home page to be a welcome to unit one or welcome to week three page, then you would turn your page into what's called a front page, and then you would make your home page that front page. So to give you an example, I'm going to say, uh, create this first page, and I'm just gonna put welcome in it. I'm going to save and publish it. So with pages and a lot of content, you have the option of saving, which means it's not gonna be published yet, or saving and publishing, so that it's gonna be saved and available to students. And this is, what the, um, this is what the page would look like. Upper left is where you go to view all pages. So the way pages works, whatever set to the first page, when you click on pages from the navigation menu, it's gonna to go to that page. So sometimes it's a little, uh, Disorient you. Okay, so good. It's going to my list of pages. So um, right now I only have one page called first page. The settings for that page, I have the option of using this page as my front page. And then it will actually show, it labels the first page as front page. So it has that gray label front page. Now I can set this page as a home page if that's what I wanted to do. So we're going to go to home. And when we talk about home, it's that first link on your course navigation menu where we have course status, where we have the option to publish. We also have the option on the far right, choose home page. 
And we saw this earlier when we created the home page and we said we want it to be the course activity stream. Now, because I have a first page listed as a front page, it actually tells me one of my options is pages, front page, and it tells me what the current front page is, first page. So this can be a very powerful tool for you. If you are going to have a different content page each week, week two, the, the week's over, you switch week three to your first page, then you come over to home page and it tells you, oh, the page that's first page is week three. If you were in week three and you were seeing week two, you know that you want to go back and switch that. So you have that label here. How did you get that drop down that's in there that goes to yep. page? I will show you again. So I'm going to go somewhere else in Canvas. So I, I'm working and now I realize I want to be on, um, I want to go to the home page. So anytime you're in your course, you can go to your home page by clicking on home, which is the top navigation item. Then at the far right, you have course status. It'll tell you if you're published, unpublished. The third option down is choose home page. So you click on choose home page and then you get to choose home page dialog box. And this is where you can decide what would you like your home page to be. And, yes, sir. And these are all sort of separate from the courses. So I, I create all these pages. And when I do a course, I can just bring them into the yes. course page. Yes. And you can have, uh, if you're teaching three different courses, you can be using pages for one course, you can be using modules for the other course, you could be using syllabus for your third course. It depends on how you're organizing the content and, and how you're going to be using Canvas for those courses. So when I select my first page, now I'm going to leave my course, I'm going to go back to my dashboard. I've just logged in. Here's my dashboard. Any student or myself, I go into it my landing page, where I first start, is that home page. And that's why changing it weekly or, I don't know, some people might change it twice a week. Um, your students go in and, oh, you know, the instructor is really making an effort here. They're updating the content in real time. How did they do that? Okay. You know, they don't get bored with seeing the same page over and over. And let's see. Da, da, da. So we talked about creating a home page. Are there any questions about home page? So you're saying so you could create like 16 home pages plus one for files. Yeah. And then just every week go in and change it. Yeah. And change the yeah. And so we're gonna actually go back and we're gonna play with the home page because we're gonna talk about the rich content editor. So I'm on my home page, and on any page you have the option to edit it. When we talk about the rich content editor, we're talking about this, um, this tool that we have in Canvas. It starts with the title. So this area that, we, that I've typed front page in, the first edit box, that's the title. Then we have the toolbar, we can get to the menu bar. So it's, it's almost like you're working in Microsoft Word. You have a menu bar, but it's hidden. Alt F9 on, why is it not showing me Alt F9? Alt F9 will display the, the menu bar for the rich content editor. So we have file, edit, insert, view, format, and table. So these are tools very similar to a word processor. Then we have the series of icons, starting with bold, the big B, and ending with paragraph. And these are all tools that allow you to change the settings of the content in the main edit uh, field, in the body. So the body is where I have welcome highlighted right now. So as I'm creating content here, I can create tables, I can create a heading structure, I can add videos, I can embed links, I can do just about anything that you would like to do in HTML. 
So much so that if you really want to just write in HTML, you have the option of using the HTML editor. And that's at the upper right of the rich content editor. So if you click on HTML editor, you get an HTML view of your content page. But most of the time, we're gonna be working in the rich content editor. If you have questions about working in HTML, that's another training. Right, and then you can just paste HTML or recognize it as working. Yes, for the most part. We have, uh, there are some updates to what is gonna be supported in this type of HTML editor, um, but we can get you more specific information about that. So usually you're gonna be working in your rich content editor, editor, so it's very similar to a word processor. Um, if I want to change this to a heading, I would click on paragraph. Notice I don't have heading level one. Heading one in Canvas is reserved for the title. So automatically that first page that I have, it's gonna be recognized as heading level one. But heading level two, heading level three, those are options for me. If I wanted to indent, then I have tools to do to indent. If I want to change font size, I have tools to change the font size. You can underline, you can change the font colors, you can um, do superscript, you can, oh, this is one of my favorites, math equations. It's writing in LaTeX. So we have lots and lots of different tools. And I can go really, really quickly through how to do a video, but we're gonna talk more about that later. One of the reasons that I'm, I'm showing you a little bit more detail about the rich content editor is because it's used prolifically in Canvas. When you're creating a discussion, this is gonna be your interface. When you create an announcement, this is gonna be your interface. So what that means is you can use videos and rich content media in all of these areas of Canvas. So as you get more comfortable with this, um, then you can add that type of content um, throughout Canvas. And students also have the option of using this editor if you give them access to creating a web page or to creating a content page. So um, if you do allow students to create or to, to collaborate on a web page or a, a content page here, then you might want to be ready to explain to the students how this rich content editor works. Because a lot of times, students will have more questions than faculty members. But inserting a video, oh, I mean, yes. I have all the stuff there, but I don't have the line at the top. This is file, edit, insert. Alt F9. Alt F9. So click on the body and then type Alt F9. I click on the body like in the middle where I where welcome is highlighted mm -hmm. and then if you're using a Windows Alt F9 should bring that up. It's one of the keystrokes in Canvas. <laughs> okay so inserting a video uh, right now the icon is it looks like a little film strip with a play button an arrow and fortunately, any of these icons, if you point to them, you'll get a caption. So we click on insert video, and we have, uh, it, we have the option of embedding or uh, finding the file. Doo -doo -doo. But what I actually want to do is, where is it now? Okay, so, no, that's not it either. Where did we go? Oh, I think I don't have the option of taking a video right now because I'm using the webcam. <laughs> I was gonna show you how to record a video really quickly. But we will go over more using rich content. I think there's, there's a, a lot more training that we're gonna be doing on, on that. And then uh, lastly, so let's say you've added videos and, and content that you created to files. The far right of the rich content editor is the content selector. So here we can create links from this page that we're currently on to other pages, to assignments, 
to quizzes, announcements, discussions, modules. So you can actually control how these links, um, how your, your course flows using a lot of these links. If, you're, if you wanted to have the students go through a sequence of pages, or um, if you wanted them to have certain links and kind of be able to go back, say you're doing a review and you want to go back to certain pages that you've already covered, this is one way that you could do that. And I don't have content in here right now, but if we went to pages, it would ask, okay, I have the first page. If I want to create a new page, it even gives me the option to create a new page and start building that link. Is there a possibility to unlock the next page once they complete the quiz or assignment? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about that. Um, that's one of the options for modules. Okay. So we're moving on to course communications. And we are just about out of time. So, Matt, is there something that in particular you want me to focus on? We were going to talk about announcements first, but yeah, I was thinking about the topics, but touch on announcements and, and modules. No, I think modules. Yeah, no, I think we should talk about some parts of the building. Yeah, why don't we do that and then we can cover the rest of the next time. Right, because we added chat afterwards and yeah. Yeah, yeah that's good. Okay. So announcements is one of your course navigation options, uh, menu item. If you click on announcements, when you have no announcements, uh, the first option is to add an announcement. And one of the reasons I was showing you the rich content editor is because when you add an announcement, you're working with the rich content editor. So you give it a title, uh, announcement one, or we'll say week one, and you would enter your content here. Again, you can have a video, you can embed a link, whatever you would need to. So, welcome to the class. If you want to add an attachment, you have the option of adding an attachment. Um, here, you can also have an option to delay the posting. So if you click on delay the posting, you can say, well, you know, I'm doing all of my announcements for this week on Sunday night, but I really want the first one to come up available on Monday morning, and I want another one to come up on Wednesday morning. You can do them all at once and then just say, this is when I would like to post them. And you click on the calendar, and it's going to have two parts to the posting, the date and the time. So you want to make sure that you enter that. Otherwise, it's going to always default to 12 a.m., which sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. And then uh, for, for announcements, you have the option of disabling any type of replies to announcements. And sometimes you want announcements as a one-way communication tool. So that is disabled in course settings. Liking is an option if you're doing more social media model and you want to allow liking, you would select allow liking. Again, you have the content selector. So if you wanted to point students in this announcement to uh, remember you're supposed to finish your assignments number one by five o'clock today, you could link to that assignment with the content selector. So you can use the announcement as a one-way tool to then redirect students to what is current in the course. So, I'm sorry, so that would just, if you hit that add link to a new page. So if we hit add link to a new page, and it just, what I'm gonna create a new page, uh, we'll call this example page, insert link. What it does is it pops that in as a link and then it will have created it for us. I'm going to save it. Oh, except I had delay posting on. So this is what the students see. 
this is your announcement, announcement for week one. It says that it was created by me. It says what time it was created. That would be updated if you had changed the posting time. Then they have a link to example one. So if this had been an actual content page, they'd be able to jump right to that page. For me, it's saying we have to finish creating it. So that's why we're getting this interaction. Right, if you want to say, like, don't forget the quiz on Saturday, then you could just- You could link directly to that quiz. If you haven't done it yet, click Yep, yep. And I'm gonna show you under course settings where you can disable those replies to announcements. So we go to course settings, back to course details, and then it's under the more options. So you have to select, you have to click on more options to show that, and then, uh, where is it? Disable comments on announcements. So if you want announcements to be a one-way communication tool, then you would need to click on that checkbox and then students will not have the option of replying to your announcements. And you would have to remember to update the course details. And when I go back to announcements and if I say I want to add a new announcement, well, I still have that, that checkbox, but it won't work anymore. <laughs> modules. Modules are a great tool for controlling or for organizing your course. And we're actually going to jump to page 16, item number 15 under content organization, modules. So modules can help you control the flow of the course you can organize it by, you can organize your content by weeks, by units, whatever organizational structure that you like. Um, it's one way, you can create a one way flow. So you can have students go through a sequence of items. And the great thing about modules is it's not restricted to one particular type of content. So once you have your assignments for uh, week one and your quiz for week one and you might have a discussion for week one and um, maybe a couple of educational resources that you've put onto content pages, you can decide, I want students to go through it in this order. And you have the option of restricting it so that they have to have viewed page one before they go to page two. So very similar to how we've created a page or an announcement, we start on add module, give it a module name. This could be week zero. We have the option to lock it. So it would say lock until. For example, if you don't want students to get into week two or future material until they've gotten through week one, so you don't want them to read ahead, this is how you would do it. You would lock things until, you would lock the module until whatever date you decide. What is it possibly action as well? To, what was that? Is it action based? Uh, you can, within the module itself, yes. Okay. So if they finish first module, they take the quiz, therefore unlock second module? Uh, so if you unlock it on that level, then everybody who finished the quiz no, we can't, we can't have a restriction between one module and another. The restrictions for that type are between modules. So if you were doing that, um, then it would have to be in one module because you would be able to lock it after, you would, you would mm -hmm. let them go to the next page after they finish the quiz. Oh, right, Matt? Yeah, yeah we, we can't say, right. so you can't say you've completed module one, mm -hmm. now you've unlocked module two. But I can't unlock pages. Yes. So they can look at their own Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that would just be kind of a larger if you were doing the whole class in one module. So we're not going to lock this one and we're just going to say add module. And now we have our week one module. So the first thing it asks us to do is it asks us to add content. Now, this is something that a lot of times we get confused on. When we add an assignment or a quiz, 
all we're doing is adding it to the organizational structure. The actual assignment or the quiz still resides in assignments or in quizzes. So the content doesn't move from those areas in Canvas. You just get a link to it in modules. So within the module, we go to add, and it's going to ask us, what would you like to add? And we can add assignments, quizzes, files, content pages, a discussion, a URL. Uh, you can have a, a tool. So if you were using a publisher tool and you wanted to have them, after they finished a discussion, go to the publisher's website, you could add a link right here and it would take them to that. And for now, because I don't have content, let's say a new assignment. Do I have an assignment? No, I don't have an assignment. Uh, so I've added an assignment and I'm going to add one other item and we're going to call it a content page because I have a content page, first page. So you'll notice first page is green because it's published, but my assignment that I created first is not published yet. So if I want to publish it, I can publish the assignment. The other area that is not green, which means it's not published, is the whole module. So week one as a module is not published. Students would not be able to get into any of this information until I publish that module. So I'm going to go ahead and publish the module. And modules have settings for all the modules, for each module individual, and then for each item within the module. So we'll publish first. And then we can go to settings for, that's not what I want, settings for the module. So we're going to click on settings for week zero. It's the same row as the title. And this is where we find requirements. So in addition to locking, we can click on add requirement. And these are the options that we have. That students must complete all these requirements or they can move through the requirements in sequential order. And this is where you can adjust those type of requirements. And you can have multiple requirements. So have a lot of flexibility in how you create this flow for the course. And I think that's one of your uh, assignments this week, right? It is. Create yes. your first module. You have, to, you, have to, you have to put four items in a module. And then after you've done that, you send me the link to your sandbox again in, um, in Canvas. And then I go and go in and check that you have four distinct if you want to make it easy on the instructor when you're sending the link, so if you wanted to, you, you have your module ready to go, the address, in the, so your address bar, whatever your browser, you can actually copy that address, paste it in your assignment to submit and send that. Then when Matt clicks on that, it's going to jump right here. So he doesn't even have to go into home and find your modules. It'll take you, it'll take them right here. So anytime you have to submit an assignment, just use the URL like that. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, what is there anything else about modules? I think that's basically. Yeah. So we have a few minutes for questions. Or we can go over the grade book a little bit or did you want to go over inbox? Yeah, gradebook. Because that's always one of the, the big questions. So gradebook is under grades. So you click on grades. Gradebook is organized like a spreadsheet. If you're not seeing the spreadsheet, it's because you're an individual view. And you can change that. The upper right. I'm going to show you the individual view. It actually 
is called Gradebook Individual View, and then you have a link switch to default gradebook. So the default gradebook is the view that looks like a spreadsheet. Well, right now, because in this course, I don't have assignments uh, created yet, except for first, and I don't have students, I do have my test student. So because we went into student view, this is what my test student looks like. And you have rows and columns for your assignments. If you have weighted your assignments, then you're going to have subtotals that can be percentages of your total grade. So we have that option as well. If you want to export your grades, you click on export and you only have the option of the CSV file. But this would give you a download of a snapshot of your Canvas grades. It's not going to refresh unless you export it again. So if you look at your grades at the midterm and then you want to look at them towards the final, you would need to export that file again. And this, if you click on the CSV file, it, however your browser is set up, I'm using Internet Explorer. Once it generates that file, it asks me what I would like to do with it. If I save it to the desktop, the default is the date with grades. So that reminds you when that file was generated. I'm going to jump back to the desktop and there it is. And this would be the version in Excel, a spreadsheet of the grades. So it has the same information that would be available in Canvas. Um, if you're going to be doing any adjusting to your grades, this is one option. You can export it and, and do whatever you need to before you report your grades. Do we have to turn in grades to the department or not? No. Uh, I'm sorry, switch to uh, what would I do? Right, yeah, we don't, have to, I, we don't have to get like a hard copy. Then uh, the other nice option that Canvas has is called the student card. Once you're in your gradebook, if you click on the student's name, and I don't know if it's going to work with test student. Yes, it is. Yay. You get this card that opens up on the right. You won't have access user because you're not, um, you're not an administrator. You would just have the students picture there if they've uploaded it, but it will show you their grades and it will also show you some other information. So if I wanted to just look at this student's grades, and this is a really nice resource if you're meeting with the students and you want to discuss their grades, now you're only showing them their grades. So let's say they came to your office or you're meeting with them online and you're sharing your screen, you would do this and that way you're protecting all the other students' information and you're just talking about that student. So this is going to mirror the information that um, you set up in your gradebook. This is also what students see when they go to grade. And by default, when students come and they look at their gradebook, over to the right, there's a checkbox that is checked and it's calculate based on graded assignments. So what that means is, let's say you have 25 assignments for the whole semester, but the student has only, and you're, you're in week three, you've only graded five assignments. The student is going to see, hey, I've gotten Bs in all five of my assignments. I have a B in the class and they're gonna be happy. But they don't have a B overall, they just have a B in those five assignments. Yeah. So students will make the mistake of coming and looking at their grades towards the end of the semester and thinking, well, I don't need to turn in any more work because I'm gonna get a B in this class. Even if I, if I don't turn in some assignments, I can only get a C in the class because you know, I'm good but they don't realize that the calculation is going to change when you have all the classes, all the assignments in. So we really recommend you orienting your students and saying, uncheck that box. So when you uncheck it, now you're looking at, this is your grade of the total points, not just the assignments. So if you want your grade as of today, 
you check the box. If you want your grade overall, you uncheck it. And that way you're gonna see, oh, you know, I've only done half of everything that needs to be done, for example. So, I'm sorry, so we, we cannot control that. For the you students. cannot we control that for the students. Tell them that they need to go and do that. Yes. So, I noticed there's like a lot of this, like, oh, I have this, and it's like, you're always talking about your grade. It's like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we, you know, we try, we've asked, you know, why isn't that, why isn't it un unchecked? You know, we, we don't have, that's, Gradebook is, is one of the areas in Canvas that is being worked on. So there are going to be changes to it, and they're supposed to be pretty substantial changes, but we don't know what they are yet. Can I ask yes, a question about Gradebook? And I, don't, I hope it's not off topic. I just did it. I've done a ton of quizzes, but the last one when the question, I, I swear the system is actually changing an answer. I mean, I put in an answer and then it, I come back in and it's the wrong answer. So I then go give credit to the students who have the correct answer under gradebook. I change their point for right. what the, the test is. They all get one more point. So I add another point and then that modifies they come to me and say i thought you gave me the wrong point so i don't know if it, if it defaults to the test quiz that i put in i don't know what's going on it's so you're test. you're talking about students have taken a quiz. a quiz and a quiz is something that was automatically scored by canvas the system. and then you come in here and you attempt to override that yeah I, first off i look at the answer and go oh no that's not the right answer and i've had this right. multiple times so yeah the answer is not even not the answer i put yeah. in so my understanding is if it's if it's automatically scored by canvas yeah. we're not going to be able to override it here we would need to go in and make an adjustment to the quiz itself okay. to make that change right. so that's i think that that's how canvas would work so we can't override the final grade in the grade score. No. Oh, oh interesting. Yeah. But can't you go in and make it like the same way that you can make exceptions for students? So and that's to, like let them take it again. And yes. It so could that be the same tool she would use? Yes, it's called moderating the quiz, and we're going to go over that probably next yeah. session. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But you have to make the change to the actual quiz or the assignment. I did want to show you one other feature in the gradebook. So for an assignment, you have several options. The, the options for the assignment don't show up until you point to the actual assignment name in the upper row. Then you have an arrow. You click on the arrow and you get the menu items or the options mm -hmm. for that assignment. So you can look at the details. It'll take you directly to SpeedGrader, which we will talk about later. Um, you can message students who have not submitted the assignment who have not completed it you also have the option mute assignments mm -hmm. so muting the assignment is designed for temporarily stopping notifications from students about the assignment if they have notifications set they're not going to get anything it's it's really meant for short term not to let the students see what you're doing as you're grading the assignments what it also does is it takes that assignment and hides it from the students and it hides it from their calculation for their grades. So when the student goes and they look at how am I doing in the course, if you have muted several assignments and you've done it for weeks, they're not going to be able to get an idea accurately of how they're doing in the course. So if you We've had the question, you know, can I just turn off all of my assignments because I don't want students to see their grade? And the answer really was, why don't you want the students to see their grades? So it's something for a faculty member to think about, you know, do you want students to be able to see their grades or not? But muting the assignment is not the way to permanently or long-term hide grades from students. It's really, you're going in there and, and you're, it's going to take you a little bit of time. You don't want the students to, you want all the students to see their grades at once. So you mute it and then as you're working on your essays or your projects, you enter all those grades or maybe um, your, your rubric allows you to have a little bit of latitude. 
So you're going through and, and you want to make some adjustments to the final grades for a project before you publish that, before you let that information out to your students. If you mute it, nobody's gonna see it until you're done. And it would just be, you would click on mute assignments and you get a little icon that shows you that assignment is muted. So it looks like an alarm that's crossed out. And to unmute the assignment, you go back to those settings and now instead of mute, you have unmute the assignment. And that's going to unmute it. As soon as you unmute it, then the students who have their notifications set, they get notifications and it gets calculated back into the total grade. Is there weighting stuff for the final course grade? And the students are looking up these kind of, you know, what my grade is right now. Mm -hmm. Will it account for weights? Yes. So if you set it, and we'll go through that, that's actually a, an assignment setting. But yeah, Canvas is really good about that. Okay. So in two weeks, we'll be talking all about assessments uh, in the online course. And so maybe just a, uh, a grade book and rubrics, and uh, so that'll be our next live workshop. And that's in two weeks? Yeah, so that'll be in a couple weeks. Um, we'll uh, send out a notice. I think 